Church family, welcome to our Sunday morning service. We're so glad that you decided to join us this morning. If you wouldn't mind doing a few things for us, we'd greatly appreciate it. First, in your upper right-hand corner, there's a Connect card. We'd love to be able to connect with you. One of the ways we do this is through the Connect card. This is the way we uh, know who is in our service and uh, what needs you might have, uh, what prayer requests you might have. This is just a great way to connect with us. Also, in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, you'll see a chat box. Like every week, we want everybody to introduce yourself. We want to see who's here. Uh, we want to say hi to you, so please go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat box. Now, this week, we have several announcements uh, uh, for us. So the first thing is our normal activities are continuing as usual. Our Sunday night uh, Bible study is at 6 p.m. <clears throat> our Wednesday night prayer night is going to be at 6.30 p.m. We have our youth activities, uh, Ignition, at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday night. We have a women's uh, uh, activity coming up on June 13th. If you'd like to be a part of this, please see Allison. She'll provide you with the link. Also today, we have our Navajo Mission Trip meeting, where we're going to think about creative ways about how we can still serve the Navajo Nation, even in the midst of this global pandemic. So the meeting will be at 3 p.m., and please use the same Zoom link that you used last time. Now, as you guys know, we did several service projects this last week, and I wanted to give you an update about them. The first project we did was we provided popcorn and uh, Otter Pops to the Gateway Student Housing. Gateway is a seminary of the Southern Baptist Convention. This is where people who are called to do ministry come to be trained. And uh, we are lucky enough to have one of these seminaries down the street in Ontario. So last week was their finals. So what we did on Monday is we just gave them an opportunity to come out and we congratulated them on finishing their semester well. We provided them with popsicles and popcorn and a friendly smile behind face masks. And it really was a great event. Uh, th this event was, was good on so many levels. First of all, it was an act of love for the Gateway Student Housing. Second, um, <clears throat> We showed the Gateway Student Housing that we love them and that we care for them. Uh, and then thirdly, we encouraged uh, these church leaders uh, to think creatively about how they can serve their communities. Of course, many of them already are, but one of my friends in particular came up to me and mentioned that uh, it, what we we're doing was a great idea and it encourages him to think creatively about how he can lead his church to serve the community. So this service project accomplished so many things and it was very successful. The second project we did is we did a meal blitz where we provided several of our church members um, meals on Memorial Day to give out to their neighbors. And this was very, very successful. We purchased roughly 18 pizzas and were able to uh, give meals to about 16 families on Memorial Day. And these pizzas were received well um, each member of our church who gave out the pizzas also wrote a personalized note and did every, made every effort to share the gospel with their neighbors. So again, this was a great project uh, that we did on Memorial Day. And the third project we did last week was we provided a meal for the Pomona Valley ER department. Uh, we purchased 20 pizzas from Domino's and uh, lots of sodas and waters and had a nice car that we took down to Pomona Valley ER. And this project also was received really well. We not only provided enough pizza for, uh, the, the, for one shift, but we had enough pizza to be provided for the next shift as well. So these were three projects we did that were received really well, that were acts of love to our community. And uh, in these projects, we not only sought to care for one another with our deeds, but our church members made every effort to share with these people the love of our God. So I'm so thankful for those of you who wrote cards, to those of you who contributed, to those of you who served. Uh, these projects were immensely successful. Church family, for the last several months, we've been meeting only remotely. We've been meeting from a distance, but soon we're gonna be able to offer our church family the ability to continue to meet remotely, but also the option of gathering again for a live worship service. On May 22nd, our president announced that 
uh, religious gatherings are deemed essential. And on May 25th, we were given guidelines from our state about what gathering in our church services should look like. So our church staff has read these policies, we've uh, thought through these policies, and we've, we've, uh, we've developed what stage one of gathering together as a church at 11th Street Baptist uh, will look like. Our policies uh, uh, range from when you enter into uh, the church parking lot, parking in every other uh, uh, space in order to promote social distancing. Also, when you enter into the building, there will be uh, tape that marks off six feet on the floor uh, to be able to maintain social distancing, and you'll be directed to enter into the church building on either the left, center, or right aisle. You'll see that some pews are marked off and that there'll be even tape and signs in our church building to be able to uh, indicate where safe places are to sit. In our church service, there will be a few adjustments. Uh, we will have printed materials, uh, won't, will not be passed out, rather they'll be digital. Our pew Bibles and hymnals will be put away for the time being, and um, our worship service will be abbreviated. The purpose of this is to, uh, uh, to uh, limit our bathroom usage. Now, of course, bathrooms will be able to be used uh, for urgencies, but we want to be able to limit use of them according to our federal government's suggestions. Well, even when we leave the church building, we'll do so in a way that continues to promote social distancing. And of course, we want to encourage uh, socially distanced, safe conversations in the parking lot. But we don't want to do that in the church building because we want to be able to have good flow in and out of the church building. My church family, um, returning to church, at least immediately, it's not going to be exactly what we hoped for. It's not going to be a return to normal. And yet it's still going to be good. When we return to church, what we're doing is we're respecting our authorities. We're taking serious to their role in our lives to promote health and to promote security. We're going to respect them and the guidelines they've set forth. And we're going to abide by these policies. We're going to wear face masks. We're going to promote social distancing. Uh, and we're going to try and limit our bathroom usage. We're going to respect our authorities. We're also going to care for one another. We're going to create an environment in our church where safety is a priority. And those who are most vulnerable to this virus are protected. We're not going to create an environment in our church where the virus can easily spread. And we're going to beg God that the virus doesn't spread at all through our church. But we're also going to take with complete seriousness the joy of meeting together. Although we're not able to do everything we want to do, we're not able to give each other hugs and have our garden exchange, we are going to be able to see each other face to face. We are going to be able to hear each other sing under the muffled face masks, and you're going to be able to see me, in the flesh, preaching. So these are all going to be joyous things. So church family, this isn't a return to normal, but this is going to, there's going to be several good things about this. So what we'd like for you to do is, uh, if you can, read our policies that, uh, that we have on our website and sent out through email. Read the policies about what church services will look like in our stage one of reopening. And also what we'd like for you to do is we'd like for you to, uh, to take a survey. We've developed a survey, and our hope is just to get a feel for where our church family is at. Are you guys excited about returning to church, given all of these policies? Are you nervous? Is your plan to come the first week we allow them, despite the face masks and abbreviated service? Are you planning on waiting? We'd love to know your thoughts so that we can have a good understanding of where our church family is at. So let's take a minute right now, and let's fill out the survey. You will see the link in our chat box and also on our screen. So please navigate to this link and fill out this survey for us.
Church family, let's, let's pray together. God, you are good and you are kind and we love you. We pray that you would be kind to us, that the virus would not spread to any of us or spread through our gatherings. And we pray, God, that we would continue to be the church in this time, loving one another, loving our community, and loving the nations. We give you thanks for your grace, and we pray for unity. We pray for unity and respect for one another. For those who are, who are taking lots of precautions and those who are taking only a few, God, let us respect one another and love one another. Let us prize protection of one another and the spread of your gospel to the ends of this earth. Continue to let us be bold with the gospel in this season, and we pray that our meeting together again soon would be done for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Church family, let's continue our worship through song.
church family, we have worshiped God by announcing the activities of our church. We have worshiped Him with song, and uh, we have worshiped Him in prayer. Let's continue our worship service now with the, uh, the reading of God's Word, continual prayer, and the preaching of His Word. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would encourage us, your people, that you would help us to see you as blessed, and that you would help us to see you as good to sinners like us, and that as we know this more deeply, <clears throat> I pray that it would lead us to praise and to pray. Do this for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Prayer is essential to the Christian life. That's maybe a bit of an understatement. It doesn't take long as you're reading the scripture to realize the importance of prayer. Our biblical heroes are portrayed in the Bible as prayers. We see this with the case with Abraham and, and Daniel, with Hezekiah and Isaiah, King David. Those heroes of the Old Testament are, are people of prayer. It's the same thing. With the New Testament, we see Jesus himself praying, the disciples as people of prayer. Paul tells the people of God to pray without ceasing. Prayer is a hallmark of what it means to be God's people. Prayer is essential to our walk with God because of what prayer is. Prayer is safe communication with the God of this universe. And when we realize that, that through prayer we can talk with God, it motivates us to pray. But prayer is also the means that God uses to accomplish his purposes. You see, God is sovereign. That means he's in control over everything. And yet, he uses means to accomplish his purposes. We see this clearly in Exodus 32 and 33. In those verses, we see that Israel has sinned. They've worshipped the golden calf. And God says, I'm going to wipe out the Israelites who have complained against me who have grumbled against me and who are now worshiping a foreign God. And what does Moses do? He prays to God in Exodus 32. And he prays that God, for the sake of his glory, would not, would not bring judgment upon his people with destruction. And God hears the prayer and relents. What happened in that encounter? You see, God's plan was to make for himself a name through the nation of Israel. That was his plan. And yet, Moses' prayer was the means that God is going to use to accomplish that plan. So you see, when we pray, it changes things. It doesn't just change us. It changes reality. Without Moses praying, Israel is annihilated. But through Moses praying, God hears and God saves and God accomplished his, his plan. So you see, prayer is, is essential. So when we come to Ephesians 1, verse 15 through 23, it's important that we realize that the context of these verses is prayer. You see, in these verses, we have some beautiful truths, beautiful descriptions of the gospel. We have verses like, uh, we have verses here that, Millions of Christians have perhaps memorized. The, the prayer is the context for verses 15 through chapter 2, verse 10. And in those verses, we have Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace we have been saved through faith. Certainly these verses have been memorized by millions of Christians throughout the age. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through chapter 2, verse 10, we have a beautiful description of the gospel. And yet we can't miss that the context of this description is prayer. You see, when we read Paul and his letters, when we realize that there's a fine line between explaining who God is, <laughs> theology, and praise. It's hard for Paul to talk about God without praising God. And likewise, it's hard for Paul to uh, talk about God without praying for the people of God. You see, there is a fine line between theology on the one hand, talking and studying God, 
and praising God and praying for God's people. What we see in Paul's prayer is that it is immensely theological. It permeates God's character. And we also see that it is a beautiful prayer of praise. We see in Paul's prayer a fine line between theology, praise, and prayer. Namely, what we have here is a theological prayer of praise. The main point of this uh, passage is that Paul prays for the church so that they might have a deeper knowledge of God. In other words, in Ephesians 1 verse 15 uh, through verse 23, we have Paul praying for the church. And what we see here is this is immensely theological and it results in profound praise. So my hope today is that you and I would be encouraged to pray. That we would be able, that we would be encouraged to pray like Paul. That we would be encouraged to pray theological prayers of praise. But not just generally. I want to give us all a very specific application. I want every member of our church family, I want to challenge you. Would you commit this week to praying for a member of our church family each day of the week, so seven members of our church family, I want you to pray for them like Paul prays for the church of Ephesians. So pick a different uh, church family member each day of this week and pray for them that they would know God more deeply, namely that they would know the hope of their calling, the riches of God's inheritance, and the power of God's might. And I'll ask you about this next week, so let that be an encouragement. So my hope is that we would pray theological prayers of praise, for that's what Paul does for the church in Ephesus. So let's read God's perfect and inspired word in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 through 23. The perfect word of our God says, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ <clears throat> when he raised them from the dead, and seated them at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him his head to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. May God bless the reading and now the preaching of his word. The first thing we learn in this passage is found in verse 15. We learn that Paul is praying for this church because they have faith in Jesus and love for the saints. You see that this prayer, we see here that uh, God is giving his people spiritual blessings. That's what we learn in verses 3 through 14. And the result of receiving these spiritual blessings should evoke within us faith in Jesus and love for one another. And that's exactly what happens for the Ephesians church. Notice in verse 15, for this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of the saints. This is the proper response. That when you realize, you and I realize that in Christ, we have spiritual blessings. We have election in verse 4. Adoption in verse 4 and 5. Redemption, verse 7 through 10. 
an inheritance in verse 11 and 12. And finally, we've been sealed with the Spirit in verse 13 and 14. When we realize that we have been blessed in Christ with these blessings, we have faith in Christ. Notice that the text doesn't say that we have faith in ourselves or in our own efforts. No, this church has faith in the Lord Jesus. But notice that the proper response to God's blessings, the salvation that you and I get to enjoy in Christ, doesn't end with ourselves. Rather, it leads the Ephesian church to love one another. And that's what our faith should do. The fact that we have been blessed in Christ should evoke within us faith in Christ. We should trust him. He is good. He is good to do good to us because we we have all these blessings in him. But it should evoke within us not merely enjoyment of God, but a desire to love one another. That's the purpose of blessings. There's always an other-centeredness to our blessings. Abraham was blessed to bless the nations. The nation of Israel was blessed to be a kingdom of priests to the nations. Peter says that you and I are saved in order to bless the nations by preaching the gospel. That's exactly how the Ephesian church responds. They respond with faith in Jesus and love toward one another. Therefore, what we learn in verse 16 is that Paul prays for the church. That this church's faith and love motivates Paul to pray for them. Now notice two things about Paul's prayer in verse 16. First he says, I do not cease. Paul is praying for this church constantly. We learn in Thessalonians that likewise, you and I are to pray without ceasing. Paul is embodying that principle here. He is praying for this church constantly. And notice the second thing. He is praying for the church. It says in verse 16, uh, I do not cease to give thanks for you. Now, prayers can be characterized by many things. They're not always characterized by thankfulness. Sometimes they're, they're characterized by bitterness, anxiety. We pray out of the anxiety of our soul. Sometimes we pray because we're discouraged. Sometimes we pray because there's been another person who's discouraged us. But then other times we pray out of thankfulness. And that's what Paul's doing here. Now this Ephesian church is evoking within Paul thankfulness. Why? Because they have responded to the spiritual blessings that we talked about in the last two sermons (laughs) properly. They believe God. They love one another. So Paul is thanking God for them. Now, we learn about the intimacy Paul has with the Ephesian church in Acts 20, where we see that there is an incredible friendship that the elders of this church have with the Apostle Paul. Paul has experienced the love of this church, and that love is causing Paul to give thanks to God. So we see that Paul hears about this church's faith and love. And it evokes within him constant prayer of thankfulness. Now in verses 17 through 23, and actually even in chapter 2, verse 1 through 10, we see an explanation of this prayer. Now we're only going to cover verse uh, 17 through 23 today, so we'll save chapter 2 for uh, next week. But what we're seeing is that the context of these verses is prayer. And more specifically, what Paul tells us in verse 17 is the purpose of his prayer. He's praying without ceasing to God, giving thanks for this church on purpose. And we see in verse 17, the purpose says that, Paul is praying that, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. In short, Paul is praying that the church would know God more deeply. You see, Paul has just talked a lot about God. He has explained that God is blessed, which means he is infinitely happy because all good things exist in God. God lacks no good thing. And he lacks 
No amount of any good thing. He has every good thing perfectly in himself. He is the final standard of good. Therefore, he is blessed. And the God we serve is a kind of God who showers his blessings on you and me. He is a blessed God who gives blessings. So what we've learned is we've learned several things uh, about our God. And now what Paul's praying is that they would learn more things about our God. He says that he wants the church to have a spirit of wisdom and a spirit of, uh, of knowledge. What this means, uh, he, he explains what this means. He says a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him. Paul is praying so that the church would know God more deeply. Now remember, the church has already been sealed with the Spirit. We learn that in verses uh, 13 and 14, that every Christian, when they believe, is sealed with the Spirit. Most likely what this is talking about here is that Paul is praying that they would have spiritual wisdom as opposed to worldly wisdom. That they would have knowledge, true, godly knowledge of who God is. What Paul is praying, the purpose of his prayer, is that this church would know God more deeply. Now, hopefully it's, uh, it's self-evident, uh, or at least obvious, that the way we think about God is immensely important. The, the, your view of God changes everything. So, for example, if you really don't think God is that powerful, you and I will be led to utter anxiety in the midst of a global pandemic. If you and I think God is reluctant to share grace, then you and I will be very fearful. Do you see the way we think about God will affect our thoughts and our actions? Every moment of every day, the view of God changes everything. If you think God is not powerful, you will worry. If you think God is stingy with his grace, you'll be very fearful. But God is, has all power. So we don't have to fear even in the midst of global pandemic. And our God is not reluctant to share his grace. He actually loves to share his grace. In fact, God created you so that he would overwhelm you with his grace. God's goal in creation, God's goal in redemption, God's goal in eternity is to shower sinners with grace. God is not reluctant to share his blessings. He's quick to share. He desires to overwhelm you with his goodness, to move you to joy so that you would savor the source of all joy himself. This is our God. Paul gets that our view of God Changes everything. Therefore, he prays that the church would know God more deeply. He wants the church uh, to know three things about God. And we learned about these verses. We learned about these in verses 18 through 23. First, he wants the church to know the hope of God's calling. Second, he wants the church to know the glory of God's inheritance. And third, he wants the church to know the greatness of God's power. So the hope of God's calling, the glory of God's inheritance, and the greatness of God's power. Paul wants the church to know these things. He wants the church to enjoy these things. Paul knows that when the church realizes these things more deeply, everything changes. So let's talk about these three things. The first thing is found in verse 18. Paul is praying uh, that, so that the church would know the hope of his calling. So let's read again verse 18. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. Now hope is a term in, that's often misunderstood. Probably the, the biggest reason why it's misunderstood is because we think hope is equated to a wish. We say things like, I hope my favorite team wins. You have no idea if your favorite team is going to win or not. Uh, this is just a wish. You, will, you wish that they win. 
Well, in Scripture, hope is not a wish. Hope is much stronger than a wish. Hope in Scripture is the eager expectation that the thing that you're hoping for will occur. When we're talking about the hope of our calling, what we learn is that uh, our hope is that you and I will live forever in God's kingdom. You and I have a hope that's rooted in a past event, namely Christ's death on the cross. And that event evokes within us hope that the redemption that we have in Christ will be completed within eternity. Remember, the spiritual blessings, they reach from eternity past in election, and they go to eternity future, where we get to enjoy an inheritance forever. The hope of our calling is the eager expectation that we will live for God, we will live with God forever. Now, the Ephesian church didn't always have this hope. We learn in Ephesians 2, uh, verse 12 through 13, that at one time the church was without God, alienated from his commonwealth, estranged from God, far from God, and they were without hope. But something happened. These Christians who were Gentiles in the flesh, they were not of the Old Testament people of God. They were not Jews. They were Gentiles. They had no hope. But what has God done? done. He has brought them near. Although they were far, he has brought them near. Although they were alienated, he made them citizens. Although they were far, he has made them a part of God's very household. Therefore, they have hope. Therefore, our hope is rooted in God's work of bringing us near. Our hope is that you and I will reign forever with God in eternity as his children, because of his glorious grace. Now our hope, like all spiritual blessings, all the spiritual blessings discussed in Ephesians 1, verse 3 through 14, all of these things come from God. Likewise, our hope. Our hope comes from God. But notice something significant about the way Paul describes our hope. He doesn't call it our hope. He does call it our hope in Ephesians 4, 4. It would have been entirely appropriate for Paul to say in chapter 1, verse 18, that he wants us to know uh, what is the hope to which uh, he has, let's see, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. It would have been entirely appropriate for Paul to say here, uh, uh, the hope of our calling. But he doesn't say that. This is the hope of his calling. What we notice here is that Paul is emphasizing that our call as Christians, when God calls us to himself and gives us redemption and salvation and an inheritance, it comes from God. God is the source. He gives the calling. And we respond in faith. So brothers and sisters, remember the challenge for this week is that you and I would pray for our church family one member a day like Paul prays. And Paul's prays that they would know God more deeply. He prays that they would know the hope of God's calling. So I challenge you to pray for our church family this week that our church would understand more deeply the hope they have in Christ, the hope of God's calling. That's the challenge. Second, Paul not only wants the church to know more deeply the hope of God's calling, he wants them to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Now, we, we learn about the riches of God uh, we've learned about this in verse 6, 11, and 13. And what we've learned in those verses is that the pinnacle of glory is grace. And what we learn in Ephesians 2, verse 7, is that uh, uh, for eternity we will see the immeasurable riches of God's grace. The riches of glory in Ephesians is 
grace. Church family, we need to realize that God's grace is rich and vast and deep. It could swallow the 29,000 foot high Everest and some. God's grace is deep and rich and vast. He has a lot of it and he loves to share it. You see, God has a lot of grace because God is good. In God, there is the perfect union of everything that's good. And God himself is the final standard of goodness. And God expresses his goodness to himself. Each member of the Trinity expresses the goodness of God to one another. And the display is beautiful, like we read in John 17. And like we read in Ephesians 1, verses 9 and 10. We see that when God expresses his goodness to one another, we see something beautiful. And you and I also get to experience the goodness of God. One way we do this is by experiencing his grace. For that's what grace is. Grace is the goodness of God expressed to sinners. Where we get grace as a gift, God shows us favor even though we deserve destruction. This is our God. Grace is the expression of his goodness and he has perfect, the perfect union of all good things. So we need to know that God has an abundance of grace. He has an abundance of it and he loves to share it. God loves to serve you and I with his grace. Jesus Christ served you and I by coming to this earth and being <laughs> the means where by God's grace can overwhelm us. Christ is the gift we get to experience. When you and I come to God, we get God. And every time I think about Christ serving me, I think it's so provocative. And sometimes I think, can it be true? And that's a good question to ask. You know, maybe every one of my sermons so far, I've asked the question or I've pointed out the fact that what king in this world uses his strength to serve you and me. That's not normal. Most kings use their position to indulge themselves. Most kings have servants who serve them. And although on one hand we do serve God, we are his servants, on another hand, God serves us. This is, was so provocative. So Peter, when Jesus went down to wash Peter's feet, Peter said, not a chance. And Jesus said, if I don't serve you, you have no place in my kingdom. You see, God, in his goodness, serves you and I with grace. He overwhelms us with grace. He lavishes his rich, rich, amazing grace on you and me. And this is the pinnacle of his glory. We learn about this in verse 6. We learn about this in verse 11. We learn about this in verse 13. We learn that God's glory is his grace. And this is God's goodness expressed to sinners like you and me. And what Paul is praying is he's praying that the church would know more fully the glory of their, the glory of God's inheritance. Now, God's people have an inheritance and they've been sealed with the Spirit now. And in the future, they will be able to enjoy that inheritance completely. And what Paul's prayer is that the people of God would experience the joy of eternity right now. And let's notice again what Paul says. This, <laughs> Paul wants the church to know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. This isn't our inheritance. Now, that would have been very true to say. We do get an inheritance in God. But what Paul says here is that he wants us to know more fully God's inheritance. Now, what that means is that the inheritance we get comes from God. He is the source. He gives it. You and I get an inheritance where we will reign forever with God, enjoying the God we were meant to enjoy and looking more deeply into the riches of his glory, which is, according to Ephesians 2, verse 7, <laughs> grace. You 
and I get an amazing inheritance. But Paul doesn't say in verse uh, 19, or in verse 18, what are the riches of your glorious inheritance? He says, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance? Stressing that this inheritance that you and I get comes from God. He gives it. And if God gives it, then it is certain. If God gives it, it is stable. If God has given you and I an inheritance, you and I, got, you and I can take it to the bank. You and I should have no doubt that in Christ we will reign and rule because this is given to us by God. So church family, this week, let's pray for a church member. For every single person out there, pray for one church member each day of this week and pray that first they would know the hope of God's calling and that they would know the riches of God's inheritance. And then thirdly, Paul prays this prayer. He's praying for the church without ceasing, giving thanks to God so that they would know God more deeply, namely his, the, the hope of his calling, uh, the riches of his inheritance, and third, the power of his might. And notice the power of his might in verse 20 through 23. This power is God works in Christ, according to verse 20. The verse says, when he, that's referring to God, raised him from the dead. So God is so powerful. God the Father is so powerful. He took God the Son and raised him from the dead. That's a lot of power, friends. You don't see many dead people coming back to life. It doesn't, doesn't happen that often. It takes a lot of power to do that. But then he also seats Jesus at the Father's right hand in the heavenly places. That takes a lot of power. It takes a lot of power to raise up a dead man and put him at the right hand of the Father in heaven. But notice what else. Not only does he raise Jesus up and seat him at his right hand, he puts every rule, authority, power, and dominion in every name that is named under the feet of Jesus. He puts them all underneath God the Son's feet. And finally, he makes God the Son the head of the church. That is power. Our God is so powerful. He raised Jesus from the dead. God the Father, so powerful. He raised God the Son from the dead. Put him at the right, his right hand. Put every authority and power and name under his feet. And made him the head of the church. Our God is powerful. You and I must remember this. You and I must know this. We must jump and dive deep into this theological truth because there are lots of temptations in this world. This world is constantly tempting you and I to find protection and security in things besides God. And the whisper is, is that these other things are more powerful than God. But what else has the power to raise somebody from the dead? Who else has the power to take somebody who is dead and raise them to life and seat them at the right hand, his right hand? Who else has that power? Who has the power to arrange the uh, hierarchy of powers of this world? Only God. So we often hear in this world that there is power in money, finances, in a bank account number. And although there is some power in money, you could buy things, the lie is pervasive. It's extensive. That says you can have power that satisfies in money. You can't. The power of money is small. The power of money is limited. That's why those who seek money always need more. That's why those who seek money always crave for more. Money is not powerful, and yet we are constantly told by this world to seek security in our money. We're constantly tempted to feel better about ourselves when we have more money in the bank. Money, its power is limited. Even something like good human relationships that are good and godly. You know, human relationships do provide a level of security. 
a level of protection, and they should. But if you and I are anchoring our security firmly in human relationships, even good ones like a marriage or our children, those relationships will be troubled. Sin and circumstances will bring trouble to our relationships. And if our anchor is firmly rooted in them, they, we will be erratic, we'll be chaotic. The protection these things offer, although important, are not ultimate. You and I need to know, we need to hold on to firmly the protection that we have in Christ. And how do we do that? Well, we know God. We know the extent of his power. He took God the Son and raised him from the dead, seated him at his right hand, put all powers under his feet, and made him the authority of the church, the head of the church. This is the power of our God. And that powerful God is not only at work in God the Son, but he's at work in you and me. What we learn in verse 19 is that this power, he is at work in all who believe. The power of God is at work in you and me if we believe. So brothers and sisters, you and I don't need to crave the protection of this world and the security of the things of this world. We have a greater security. We have an anchor that keeps our ship from being tossed to and fro. We have a foundation that's sure in Christ. So brothers and sisters, we need to rest in Christ. Now next week, Paul is going to talk more about this power. And this power is so amazing. It not only raised Jesus from the dead, but we're going to learn in verses 1 through 10 that it also, it also raises us from the dead. And because of that power, you and I can rest in God. You and I can have peace with God. And you and I can do good deeds for the glory of God because we are safe. Brothers and sisters, Paul wants the church to know the power of God. So this week, church family, every single day from Monday until Sunday, I want you to pray for a church member of our, uh, a member of our church family. Every day, a different member. And I want you to pray that they would understand more deeply the hope of God's calling, the inheritance the riches of God's inheritance, and the power of God's might. You see, brothers and sisters, God has blessed us with incredible blessings. We learn about this in verse 3 through 14. Remember, election, adoption, uh, redemption, our inheritance, and being sealed with the Spirit. And on the one hand, those blessings should lead us to praise God. We see that in verse 6, verse 11, and verse 13. But on the other hand, it should lead us to pray. That's what it causes Paul to do. Paul knows that this church has blessings and they've responded to these blessings properly. Therefore, Paul prays. So brothers and sisters, this week continue to praise God for his incredible blessings. But also, let's pray. And notice that Paul isn't praying for himself here. He's praying for the church. I challenge you, church family, to pray without ceasing in thankfulness for our church family, that they would know more deeply who God is and what he does for us in Christ. You see, brothers and sisters, when you and I know more deeply that you and I will live forever with God, that we have a hope that's not of this world, then you and I can rest, even in the midst of the anxieties, and difficulties of this world. So church family, let's go to war for one another. Let's protect one another. Let's, let's provide for one another. How? By praying to God that he would give our church family a deeper understanding of his character, that he'd give our church family a deeper understanding of his hope, his inheritance, and his power for the joy of our church, and for the glory of our God. Now, certainly there are some non-Christian friends who might be watching this, this sermon. Our God is a God who 
who loves to shower sinners with grace. I know. I'm a sinner. A big one. Doesn't take long to be around me to know that I'm a big sinner. But I have received grace. Not because of me, but because God is gracious. So I would encourage you, non-Christian friend, turn to Jesus. Turn to Jesus at the cross. You have a perfect expression of God's justice. He is punishing sin. And a perfect expression of his mercy. He is providing the means whereby he could save sinners. So would you trust in Jesus? That in Jesus there's salvation? That in Jesus there is the spiritual blessings? Turn from every attempt to find redemption in the things of this world. Forsake the call to justify yourself. Get rid of the pursuit of trying to be made right with God on your own efforts. Forget all of that and trust in Jesus. And as you do, you will experience immense blessings and you will have delight because the sin that was on your back and crushing your soul is gone. You will have joy and you will praise God for this joy. So if that's you, if you have begun to trust in Jesus today, would you reach out to us? You can email us. You can call us. You can type it into the chat box. You can request prayer at the bottom of our service. We would love to know about this so that we can love you, disciple you, and praise God for the work he is doing in you. So please reach out to us. Church family, let's commit to praying for a member of our church each day this week that they would know more fully the hope of their calling, the riches of God's inheritance, and the power of God's might. Let's pray. God, I pray this week that we would be diligent to pray for one another. Just as Paul prayed, and let our prayers be immensely theological. Let them be, let them be inundated with a right understanding of who you are. And let our prayers lead to praise, for you are doing a work. Let us pray like Paul this week for our church family, that we might know you more deeply. Your calling, your inheritance, and your might. In Jesus' name we pray.